Hume's moral philosophy builds upon his empiricist theory of mind, an introduction to which can be found here. In short, all human knowledge is a product of our experience, derived primarily through our senses, but also through how we feel, our passions, emotions, temperaments. All of these function as inputs into the mind. The moral philosophy that is an extension of this is also responding to two types of argument. The theological one, that argues that morality comes from God, and the rationalists that argue that morality is a product of human reason, culture, or education alone. Hume was also a naturalist in two ways. He didn't believe morality had any religious, supernatural, or spiritual foundations. But second, he believed that humans had a human nature, that is, something that we are wired biologically with. He was also a moral sentimentalist, meaning the foundation of our moral behaviour can be found in our emotions, our feelings, our sentiments. The Treatise of Human Nature, published in 1738, was divided into three volumes, Understanding, Passions and Morals. His moral philosophy was also simplified into the later work, An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. In book two of the earlier work, Hume considers how passions are part of these original impressions on the mind. Pleasure, pain, hunger, anger are impressed upon the mind. They are felt by the mind as originary inputs. Because these inputs are the foundation, reason is secondary to them. As he famously puts it, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. He thought that rather than being a product of rational calculation, morality was something that, like a passion, was felt. Arguing against systems of morality built upon reason, he writes, Truth is disputable, but not taste. What exists in the nature of things is the standard of our judgment. What each man feels within himself is the standard of sentiment. Propositions in geometry may be proved, systems in physics may be controverted, but the harmony of verse, the tenderness of passion, the brilliancy of wit, must give immediate pleasure. The problem with arguing that morality is rational, mathematical, geometrical, is that it builds something metaphysical that is meant to be transcendental, universal, eternal, outside of the realm of humanity. For Hume, morality must be human. He looks at what happens when we see virtue or vice. He says that the things we call virtuous produce a feeling of agreeableness or pleasure, while the things we call a vice produce a disagreeable sentiment. We don't reason and logically explain to ourselves why we approve or disapprove of something. It arises as a sentiment. He gives the example of murder. You might see a number of actions or moments when you witness a murder. A man demanding another's wallet, a refusal, a gun fired, a man hit, blood, lifelessness, fleeing. Hume's point about impressions, what he calls matters of fact, is that none of these inputs to the eye or ear is a moral input. We don't see or hear morality. It's not a matter of fact. There's nothing illogical, irrational or contradictory about the process of the murder. It's just a series of facts. This is why he makes the famous is ought argument. That you can't get an ought about the world, you ought not to murder, from simply observing facts in the world. He writes, In every system of morality, which I have hitherto met with, I have always remarked that the author proceeds for some time in the ordinary way of reasoning and establishes the being of a god or makes observations concerning human affairs, when of a sudden I'm surprised to find that instead of the usual copulations of propositions is and is not, I meet with no proposition that is not connected with an ought or an ought not. Rather than rationally constructing an ought, we have feelings in response to a series of actions. Feelings of anger, fear, surprise. His point is that we don't have to use our reason to feel this disapproval, what he calls disapprobation. He uses the terms approbation and disapprobation, approval or disapproval, and these feelings are directed at a person's actions. Consequentialists argue that morality is about outcomes, how much good an act produces, but for Hume, it's more than the consequences. It's about motives, why someone acted, their personal merit. 
For example, for consequentialists, if the murdered man was a bad person, it would be a moral action to murder him no matter what the motive. But for Hume, approbation is an appraisal of a person's action. We don't deem the sun moral for shining or mice for chewing through the ropes of a kidnapped man, or a lion for killing a leopard. Hume then moves on to take a closer look at what motives might be, and he sees only three. Self-love, engaging in an action for self-interest. Private benevolence, acting in the interest of a group, a family, a circle, a friend, etc. And general benevolence, acting in the interest of humanity, generally. While actions can be motivated by a mixture of all three, our idea of justice, when evaluating a moral act, arises out of a consideration of the last two, and he argues that what we really feel when we appraise an act is a snap judgment of general utility. Generally, he argues, the actions we praise as moral are those that produce happiness, satisfaction, utility. He writes, in all determinations of morality, This circumstance of public utility is ever principally in view, and wherever disputes arise, either in philosophy or common life, concerning the bounds of duty, the question cannot by any means be decided with greater certainty than by ascertaining on any side the true interests of mankind. He continues, The eye is pleased with the prospect of cornfields and loaded vineyards, horses grazing and flocks pasturing but flies the view of briars and brambles affording shelter to wolves and serpents. He then breaks down these feelings of approbation and disapprobation about utility into two categories, the natural and the artificial. The natural are part of our human nature, take no culture or education to learn, and are simply natural reactions. The artificial ones extend from the natural ones, but also from reason, from education, from thought, Importantly, though, they still have their basis in nature. The natural virtues are those immediately praised by others as being useful. He lists many, including prudence, temperance, frugality, industry, assiduity, enterprise, dexterity, generosity, humanity, compassion, gratitude, friendship, fidelity, zeal, disinterestedness, liberality, perseverance, patience, activity, vigilance, application, constancy. Of these natural virtues, he says, their merit consists in the tendency to serve the person possessed of them without any magnificent claim to public and social desert. He also describes them as qualities immediately agreeable to ourselves and to others. It has to be stressed here that he agrees that the specificities of moral behaviour are up for debate. He's more interested in working out the foundations of why they arise. In short, the natural feeling of approbation based primarily on usefulness, utility. He says these traits universally express the highest merit, but he goes on to say that it's not his present business to recommend generosity or benevolence, but it's just a commentary on the practical part of morals. He's of course more interested in the philosophy. He argues that each feel our way around these sentiments weighing consequences. We also have a sense of artificial duty that arises primarily out of a sense for justice. In the inquiry, he also calls this a social virtue. The ways he describes this in the treatise and the inquiry differ slightly, but our sense of justice arises out of the natural desire for public utility. He takes the example of property to prove that this artificial justice is neither simply rationally constructed like a universal theorem, nor theologically justified, as was commonly argued at the time. He says that if the world had been one of absolute abundance, the need for property would never arise. Alternatively, if there was absolute scarcity, we'd be warring over the little that was left, and property would just be abolished. Property, then, is not a rational, transcendental, absolute law, but arises out of necessity, out of circumstance. This is contrary to someone like Locke, who argues that property rights are natural in themselves, in a God-given way. Hume writes, The common situation of society is a medium amidst all these extremes. We are naturally partial to ourselves and to our friends, but are capable of learning the advantage resulting from a more equitable conduct. He says that it's this sense of artificial justice that leads to a political community. When people come together who don't know each other, who aren't friends, we require a custom to know how to act. 
But these artificial duties grow like a plant out of the natural ones. Even robbers and pirates, he says, have some kind of code. Even roads, wars, wrestlers need rules of some kind. He argues that these abstract ideas of morality have a pull on us like a magnet because we know they're better for us in the end. Would you rather have your company coveted, admired, followed, he asks, rather than hated, despised and avoided? Hume's argument is complicated, but the foundations are more important than the commentary that follows. What's new, unique and influential in him is the dialectic between personal feelings of utility for ourselves and those around us, and the universalising public moral rules, both natural and artificial, that arise out of them. A dialectic between self-love, looking after ourselves, and the approval of the community, actions that result in the good of all and make all better off. Rationalists might construct a theory of morality that sets itself opposed to the passions and the feelings, one meant to keep emotion in check. In opposing this, Hume was ahead of his time psychologically, and not as easy to place as most modernist thinkers are. In the 20th century, Gilles Deleuze argued that Hume was much more radical than he's usually interpreted as being, and that he is primarily a subjectivist, because those impressions and feelings differ radically between people. Hume himself wrote that the difference that nature has placed between one man and another is so wide, and this difference is still so much farther widened by education, example and habit. His philosophy of morality is a human one. It argues against systematization from absolute dogmatic abstract rules and instead advocates feeling, being in the world, summarised by one of his most well-known phrases, be a philosopher but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. If you like these videos, I need your help, and here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month, and if you pledge five dollars, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support Then and Now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping Then and Now grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.